Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Talking About Birds, the only Cardinal podcast grumpier than Chip Carey looking at a sheet of saber metrics. <laughs> my name is Nate Heininger, and I am joined, as always, by my co-host, Ben Samorka. Uh, hi, everybody. <laughs> high energy this week thanks ben <laughs> <laughs> and this week i was thinking should i do should i do a quote from his granddad should i just say hi but i just said hi so yeah. you went for the most boring option good radio <laughs> all right and uh, this week we are going to be talking about scott Rowland. we're going to talk about chip carey and his new role we're going to dig into the zips projections and we're going to talk about a whole bunch of other stuff If you have an idea for the opening bit, tweet us at Talk About Birds. Big week, Ben. Big wow. week. There's snow on the ground here in St. Louis. I love uh, the weather talk. I know. I thought we, we've really had um, a lot of success just jumping into weather right out of the gate. So I thought I'd keep that going. Um, no, I've got breaking news to talk to you about. We we've did talked did about. Did 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 yeah. did. We, we've mentioned it a little bit on the show um, over the past few weeks, and Molly and I, we took the plunge. We went and we saw a movie at Alamo Drafthouse, which just recently opened up here in St. Louis. <laughs> took the plunge. Uh, yeah, I know. It's a big deal going out there. Yeah. Ha- seeing a movie. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know how you uh, do it. Well, let me tell you how I do it. So... It was actually pretty funny. It's at the new uh, like foundry area, which has a big parking garage. And we didn't really know exactly where we were going. So we parked in the parking garage, got out of our cars, went one direction, proceeded to walk for like 15 minutes uh, trying to find the movie theater. And we found it. And then later that night when we left the movie theater, we realized that we parked literally as close as you possibly could to the theater. We just went out the wrong door. Uh, so Dumbass. that was, that was a funny revelation, but, um, I know you're a big fan of this theater. There's been one in Denver for a little while now. Yeah. Yeah. We got a couple of them. Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a freak for it. Uh, wow. Well, really it's like, it's, it's where the movie nerds go, right? Which is good. The food yeah. is good. The beers are good. But what I really like about it is that they do like, I, you know, I was talking about seeing that, uh, uh, Mulholland Drive, like they do those old showings for discounted prices. They have a full bar. What's not to like? Yeah, yeah. And uh, hey, you know we're not uh, we're not sponsored by Alamo Draft House, but hey, but if you're out there listening, uh, Mister Draft House, um, it's not Mister Alamo. <laughs> no, that's his first name. <laughs> oh, what a talking convenient about, situation for yeah, him. Talking about birds is for sale. Um, yeah. yeah, so. I'll just take a movie uh, ticket. I'm not, I don't need much. The thing that really I liked the most there was the bottomless popcorn. <laughs> and that's not a new thing at movie theaters, of course, but there's a couple things that made it stand out to me. Um, Cause you know, you and I, I remember we'd get the, the Ben and I way back in the day, we only did this a handful of times, but it was always fun. We'd go and see like three or four movies in a single day. And get that giant tub of refillable popcorn and oh, yeah. fill it up, fill it up in between movies. Um, but here, first of all, they bring you the popcorn in a big bowl. Oh, which, forget about it. Which, it's a big metal bowl. I love a big bowl. I mean, come on, it's eating popcorn. I want it in a bowl. And it I like it for a couple reasons. One, just cuts down on trash. You know, there's just that's way more sustainable, just giving people a big bowl. And then two. Uh, you don't get all the sound of like a hundred people crunching into their popcorn bags, like, you know, Hey, uh, it's a silent bowl. Forget about it. (laughs) Tell you what though, if you drop that thing, it's going to (laughs) clang. That's a good point. Fortunately, (laughs) I I avoided dropping it. Um, well, the clumsiest man I know, but yeah, good for you. I'm in complete control of my body at all times. Thank you very much. (laughs) Okay. Uh, the thing that really stuck out to me though, the thing that made it pop 
is that they'll come and refill it for you. Yeah, that shit is fire right there. 100%. That's the problem with bottomless at anything at a yeah. movie theater is I don't want to leave. I'm here to see the th- see the movie, so yeah. I don't want to leave. But they'll come and refill it for you. Um, it was nice. I also yeah. had pork fried ravioli. They call them toasted ravioli, but you know they're definitely like deep fried. Yeah, uh, which was good um and in like a hatch green chili sauce which i guess is their thing yeah uh yeah, they, yeah it was they all over the menu too. so funny that that's like the st louis thing and the the denver thing it's it's like a, a buffalo chicken wrap like with avocado <laughs> if you yeah. guys get deep fried ravioli and we uh, are better <laughs> that is what i was trying to say uh so yeah it was good it was a it was a fun experience um definitely preferred over like pretty much every molly and i were both like Yep, this is probably we're just where we're gonna go see theaters yeah. and, or see movies now. They had a bunch of French posters for other for old movies all over the wall, which was cool. Yeah. So, it is cool. Yeah. Uh I and I got to eat popcorn for like an hour and a half straight, which is truly all I ever really want to do. Yeah. Um so it was nice. That's that is why God invented movies. <laughs> God did invent movies. All right. Uh, we got we got a lot to talk about this week. Some major things have happened. But first and foremost, we got to congratulate Scott Rowland, right? Like what a ooh, 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 what ooh. a, uh, you know, should have been first ballot. We all know that. Yeah. But the 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 baseball writers process for getting people into the Hall of Fame is an absolute mess and kind of a disgrace. But whatever Scott Rollins yeah. in. So that's a topic for a whole other period, but um, really excited. I yeah, obviously well-deserved. Yeah. Yeah. To be a, a stick in the mud really quick. I do think that if you submit a blank ballot, not if you don't, if you refuse to submit a ballot, I'm okay with that. But if you submit a blank ballot, which then takes away from everybody's percentages because oh, okay. it adds to the voting pool, I think that you should lose your right to vote for the hall of fame. It's yeah. completely stupid that we have to worry about idiots. There's some idiot writer from Philadelphia that only voted for Jimmy Rollins. Um, yeah. It's like, how are you looking at these numbers? How are you qualifying this? You are, you are clearly unqualified or not thinking about this or taking it seriously. Um, but I don't want to complain about that. I do just want to talk about like Scott Rowland, uh, you know, however you slice it, he is a top 10 third baseman of all time. Um, he is a world series champion with the Cardinals. He is part of one of the best trades. I think the Cardinals have made in the past, like 50 or so years. Um, you trade for yeah. a hall of fame level player to complete the MV three. That was, you know, Pujols, uh, Edmonds and, and Mr. Roland, all three of which I believe should be in the hall of fame. And obviously Pujols will be a first ballot. We'll see what, if Jimmy can get on through some type of veterans committee or, or something like that. But, you know, just to go over it, like like I said, top three or, or top 10 third baseman of all time. He's like right around the Chipper Jones, um, Adrian Beltre, Beltre type uh, level player. Yeah. Um, and I think like what's what what should be talked about with Scott Rowland and, and you can really say this about any player, I, I guess. So but but I think it it makes sense to caveat him with this because he is now making to the hall of fame is I'm sure most Cardinal fans remember uh, that shoulder injury that he had to go through that uh, while he was running down first base, ran into the first baseman and his shoulder was never the same. It kind of sapped his power still played for years after that. And I think he would have been probably more of a slam dunk. Like he was a slam dunk. Like you said, he should have been first ballot, but I think had he not had that weird freak injury where it was just kind of the wires got crossed sprinting down the first baseline. Um, he would have padded those numbers even more. Um, but yeah, cou- couldn't be happier. Well-deserved. I hope he wears a Cardinals cap. Um, yeah. you know, he, he didn't spend all of his career with the Cardinals. Uh, he obviously had a great year or a career with the Phillies as well. Um, but yeah, awesome news. Yeah, very excited for him. Um, I also agree Jim Edmonds should be in. I try to be objective on that. Obviously, we are we are biased. We have a Cardinal podcast, but I yeah. truly think um, you know, he'd be bottom bottom sort of rung of Hall of Famers, but I still think he should be in the Hall of Fame. Um, but anyway, Scott Rowland, yeah. um, 
yeah, incredible career. And yeah, it's it's a difficult choice for him. I it's from what I understand, it's not technically his choice. It's technically the Hall of Fame's choice on what uh like hat he's wearing on his plaque. Um, but they obviously listen, they take his um opinion seriously in it. So it probably is ultimately down to him. Uh he has said he has not he's not ready to make a decision yet and that he's going to talk with the hall about it because it does kind of come down to like do you do the place where you made your name and your career was started and you really like came out onto the scene or do you do the place that you had fewer years but really your peak years yeah um i i could see why either would be the choice obviously i think we all hope it's the cardinals um there's always the option that he does the no logo um which is what people do to sort of not pick a favorite which is also fair but um it seems yeah, to me that, to make make sense that, you do the team where you had your best years and your, your biggest platform you know but i yeah. don't know yeah and it's not i'm not going to be like my feelings aren't going to be hurt if he decides to go with right. no cap um that that seems probably it, i would guess if, if i had to bet a wager on it it would be like cardinals no cap phillies yeah yeah I don't know. I think some guys, it's not uncommon for guys to really value whatever team like chose them and, and yeah. had them come up through. And, and, you know, and he had a lot of really good years at the Phillies, uh, he but did, but he also like had the was, whole run in with Larry Boa that was yeah, going on was, his, him and his agent tried to sign into his contract that the Phillies had to have a certain level of spending for him to stick around yeah. and when he was re-upping. Like it was a bit of a fraught relationship. And I think like, you know, Obviously, Scott Rowland's going to be all like sunshine and, and rainbows uh, around this time of him getting elected. But I think I don't think he was like a grouch. I think he was just like or the sense that I get and I'd love to be corrected on this. But the sense that I get is that like he kind of was just not worried about how he was being perceived. Like, right. He was going to do his thing. He was going to say what he meant. And sometimes that would rub Larry Boa or Tony Lewis the wrong way. And uh, they would try to captain the ship. And when you have a six, five, 240 pound MVP third <laughs> baseman, he's going to do his own thing, you know? So that's, that's just kind of how it went. Yeah. Yeah. That there was definitely confrontations on every team that he was a part of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so we'll see, yeah. we'll see, but it's really cool. It's nice to have, um, you know, a good story around the hall of fame. It's been trash for years over years now. Yeah. Um, so yeah. And, uh, I want to go on a slight tangent just to go back to Jim Edmonds, because I, I just think that we could, should bring this up every once in a while. Like I just, while we were talking, I pulled up the, uh, total numbers from 1992 to 2022 Jim Edmonds is the fourth best center fielder in that time. Andrew Jones is the third best. And I think both of those gentlemen belong in the Hall of Fame. Uh, so hopefully we can somehow weasel Jim Edmonds in there. Um, it makes sense to me. Um, but yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll see what happens. Uh, 64 and a half F war, which puts him well above a lot of other Hall of Fame players. Um, I think he mostly um, was a victim of the hall of fame uh ballot bloat that happened because of all of the uh, steroid guys that were on yeah. there for 10 years instead of uh the one year that they should have been before being elected into the hall of fame and yeah. so it, it it just made this gridlock where half the voters were voting for guys like bonds so that's where some of their votes are going and it's keeping them on when it should have been like with what happened with roland this year you know like there's a bunch of interesting guys on the on the ballot. Most not uh, going to make it, but it's cool that their name is there. And then everyone centers around a couple people that are at the top and they get in, yep. you know, and that basically ground to a halt because every year for 10 years, half the votes went to Bonds and, right. uh, and Clemens and all these other guys. Yeah, and that's one more other gripe I have to pick with the whole Hall of Fame selection committee, not only the blank ballot nonsense that happens every year, or every year for the last like five or six years. Um, but the, why, why are we limited to 10? Why, like, why is there yeah. an arbitrary limit on how many people you can vote for? Um, like that has 
or I guess explain how that makes sense. Like if there are certain, if there are 12 hall of famers in a class you, and they're all deserving, you can't vote them all in no matter what. Like yeah. why, why are we limited to that? It should be whatever you want. So if you believe that the steroid guy should be in, that shouldn't punish somebody like Beltron or Roland or who, you know, any of these newer class. Um, although <laughs> Beltron was the wrong name to drop because he might be <laughs> getting stuck out because of the whole Astros science yeah, thing. I, I that's a whole other topic why. though. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not a good one to pick. Cause yeah, not a good a, one. No, not it's at like all. him and Manny are like, you know, different reasons, but yeah. they're, they're, you know, they might be on there slowly and for a long yeah. time, but, um, Man, I want a Manny hall of fame speech so bad. I, <laughs> I like that, that more than anything. I'm really torn on Manny. This is a whole new conversation, but I, I am someone who believes Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens should have been first ballot inner circle hall of famers. But these guys who got popped well after all of that is where I start to get a little more like, yeah, maybe they, maybe they did do something that is, uh, disqualifies them from the hall of fame because yeah. doing steroids, in uh what 2007 or whatever i could be yeah. way off on that it was very different than doing steroids in 1997 you know so yeah I, absolutely. I i'm probably not voting for manny um but i'm trying to be intellectually consistent on why i say like barry bonds first ballot inner circle and not yeah. manny ramirez yeah yeah it is i mean with barry bonds you can literally cut his career in half and he's still a hall of fame player uh, i think yeah. the thing and we should move on from talking about manny ramirez on a cardinals podcast but <laughs> the th i just have this child brain memories of him being the like one of the best right-handed hitters i've ever seen and in like yeah. in a little like he had like a swag and a way about him that i've also never seen like pujols obviously the best right-handed hitter i've seen in real life um, but he was, you know, his nickname's the machine. Uh, he had a very mechanical cerebral approach and Manny looked like he rolled out of bed and then could just go hit three thirty. Um, yeah. maybe it was assisted by drugs. You know, maybe there were all kinds of things going on, but he just had this, like, you, you can't get him out type vibe to him. That was, that Manny, was, you know, yeah. fun to watch Manny being Manny. Uh, he has yeah. the, my single favorite, uh, catch in all of baseball history which is him intercepting that cutoff <laughs> throw. <laughs> oh, he just lost focus there for a second. Bit, it's like the best catch he made in his entire it really career is. was. <laughs> Full lateral dive. Full lateral dive. Cut off the cutoff. The, <laughs> the cutoff a cutoff. Yeah, it's, it's so uh, good. Yes. But there's a ton of good little Manny stories. But anyway, there yeah, are, this, yeah. Is, this is not a Manny podcast. Um, all right, so let's move on. Yeah. You know, one of the other big things that happened this week. And, and we've said on the show, like arguably the most impactful thing the Cardinals have done this off season. Um, and that's not even a criticism on an otherwise dull uh, off season. They could have signed like eight people and this still would have been maybe yeah. the biggest impactful thing, which is they've hired a new play by play guy. Yeah. Um, it kind of went from no news to all of a sudden, a lot of news. Yeah. Um, it seemed like Aaron Goldsmith was, maybe going to be the guy, um, which I know we've had uh, opinions on both sides on this show about him, but generally people were really excited. And then he backed out and he did a really nice uh, tweet, basically explaining uh, whacking his microphone around. I, I know. Actually, I hit the cable on my microphone. Um, basically thanks, saying thanks like, for clearing that up. Yeah. 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 Uh, the Mariners are there is home now and he's not leaving. Yeah. So, Seemed like he got really far. And uh, then Root and Sports in Seattle gave him a huge raise. No, we're yeah. not losing him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, good for him. He knows what he wants. And yep. obviously he's uh, sought after. So he, you know, did what he thought was right. And that's when uh, we learned there was another name in the race. And then like, I don't know, a day later, it was announced that he was signed, which is yeah. uh, Chip Carey. Um, from yeah. the Braves broadcast, which has caused quite a riff <laughs> uh, in Cardinal fandom. Um, yeah. I'm going to let you speak here in a moment because I know your opinion uh, already. Yeah. Um, but basically, on the one hand, you have a lot of people who I think um, really appreciate the the sort of history of this hire and and the continuation of having a carry 
uh, in the St. Louis, have, you know, broadcasting a St. Louis sport. Um, you know, baseball is a, uh, you know, largely a traditional sport and these sort of storylines are celebrated frequently in baseball. And this is one of those, you know, the grandson of Harry Carey. Uh, how cool is that? Right. Um, and then there's the other side of it, which is I will let Ben, uh, you share your opinion on Chip Carey. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I've been thinking about how to talk about this on the podcast. And so I will just say like blanket statement, I'm not excited about this hire. Um, and I'll, I'll guess I'll try to do my best to explain this. And Nate, you just cut me off if I'm like getting too <laughs> rambly here. Like, please, please. Terrible. Umpire. Yeah. Terrible. Uh, yeah. I'm not even going to say terrible, but here, here's well, how I you, feel. I about don't know it. if you've. I don't know if you've seen it. There's a video going like going around. Oh, he the... he call he calls throws terrible, which yeah. is kind of fun. And there was yeah. like a super cut of him calling throws terrible that yeah. I kind of enjoyed watching. Yes. Uh, so I, I guess here's what I'll say. I, I watch a lot of baseball um, and I think I have a sense of a decent number of announcers across the league. And it should be noted that like when you watch a couple of Braves games or you're a Cardinals fan that's watching 160 ish games a year, it's very different spending 500 hours with that person as opposed to spending a few hours or, or whatever. So I'll, I'll caveat that all, but I watch a lot of Braves games. I like the Braves. Uh, I'm a huge Acuna fan. I like, uh, I mean, Freddie Freeman back in the day, as you be, they have a very exciting team. Um, so I just find myself watching a lot of their games and I find chip carry to be a, big stick in the mud. I think that he kind of kind of like the criticism around Aaron Goldsmith, although like you said, it seems like Seattle was really unhappy about him getting shipped out. Um, so, or uh, potentially getting shipped out. So I, I will criticize chip carry in being boring. Um, I think that he sounds, he announces games like he's in the eighties or nineties. He is anti advanced analytics. Um, and what I don't like is that rather than giving somebody who, well, Aaron Goldsmith, who's still young and, and rising, we're giving somebody an opportunity, arguably one of the best play-by-play -play jobs in baseball, as far as the market, fan interest, the, the ratings, how many people are watching this broadcast every single day. We're giving a guy who's been doing it averagely for decades this great opportunity. The other issue that I have is the Nepo baby factor, which is would Chip Carey be an announcer if he wasn't the grandson of who he was the grandson of? I don't know. Maybe he would have got there on his own merits, but we know for a fact that he got that Braves job because that's where his dad was. And his dad got that job because of who his dad was. So the right. whole idea of like, at least for the baseball player nepotism thing that's happening, like Vladdy Guerrero Jr. has to go hit that baseball. Like, Obviously, Chip Carey is not an idiot. Like he can call a game and it's fine. But we're picking somebody who is kind of set in their ways, who is openly <laughs> talks about on the broadcast how advanced analytics are ruining the game. I now I'm going to get mad about something that hasn't happened yet. I'm going to assume he's going to lament the new rules that are coming down the way or complain about how they're changing the game or about how the players aren't playing the game right. And. Well, I think it is fine to celebrate a, you know, scoring on an, a bunt hit and then stealing second and then two sack flies because that's a run scored. Like there are other ways to look at this game. And I think there are better ways to sell this game. And my least favorite aspect of a play by play person or really anybody in baseball media is complaining about the existing product. It how <laughs> you are yeah. appeasing one group of listener. Uh, which is the stick in the mud list or listen or, or, or watcher or whatever. You are not selling it to anybody. You are really just raining on everybody else's parade. Who's having a great time watching, you know, new bar be a three true outcome or, or however it, it, you know, these players manifest. Um, so that's kind of my opinion. Um, I don't like it. I, he's 57. Um, I wonder how long he's going to be here. Um, we're going to get to know him. Maybe he'll win us over. I am going to try to come in with a, I, I feel this way right now, but I'm not going to not watch Cardinals games. Um, right. You know, they, they, there are worse hirings that they could have done. 
uh, Mike Clevenger or something like that. Uh, but uh, <laughs> ooh, <laughs> that's, I, that would that would be a twist. That would be a twist. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's kind of my two cents on this whole thing. Like, does he deserve to be here? No. Do I think he's particularly good? No. Um, will Brad Thompson, you know, be a good combination with him? Probably. Maybe he'll lighten up. Um, because I will say yeah. that the Braves broadcast got a lot better once Frenchy, uh, Jeff Rancor, uh, joined them because he's funny, affable, a good player, you know, understands the modern game, all that stuff. Um, but yeah, I think, um, I, I don't know. I think this franchise deserves better. I think that we deserve better. I think that they could have found somebody either in their system or a younger hire or just really gone any other direction. Yeah, I mean, it's hard for me to argue with any of that other than the, I'll just throw in that I like don't really ever listen to the broadcast very much. And I only say that to say, like, I don't feel like I ever really heard him on Braves. Like, I'll watch Brave games because I agree with you. I really enjoy the Braves, um, you know, once I remove how much I hate that the Cardinals have to play against them, uh, yeah. you know, from the equation. But they're a fun team and I'll go and I'll watch a Braves game. But I'm like don't really pay attention that much. So I don't have an existing opinion of him um, coming in. Yeah. Um, all I have to go off of is, is, you know, takes like this. And I will agree with you that like, that is also my least favorite thing about uh, um, current broadcasters, or that is the thing I hate most about certain broadcasters. And yeah. I think Jim Edmonds does it a little bit. And yes, he does. I am. And I'm worried that they will basically feedback loop themselves into hating everything, especially as the Cardinals continue to um, lurch more towards a more analytical approach to the game. Uh, you know, I would, it will be very frustrating if we have Ali Marmol and Dusty Blake and, and right. all these new guys um, that are really trying to take the uh, team to this next level. And you've got the spokesperson for the team, essentially the, the average fans um, sort of, guidance into yeah. understanding baseball um they're actively lamenting the things that the team is trying to do in order to be successful that will be very very frustrating um i hope that that does not happen but what was it i think you might have linked it in the discord they're like fan graphs ranked uh the braves broadcast as old man yelling at clouds like yeah. you know there's definitely that is a prevailing opinion about him and right. it's just boring and and not fun and kind of the counter of what a broadcaster should be doing. So yeah. maybe he'll come here and turn a new leaf because yeah, like being in St. Louis, being the broadcaster, like it's a celebrity position, man. Oh like, yeah. Like Dan McLaughlin, I you'd be walking around in like the grocery store and it'd be Dan McLaughlin's voice is playing over the, uh, you know, over the speaker or like he's all over the place. It is a major position here. And so there's, yeah. we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I want to like qualify my opinion just one more time. Like it is not his age uh, that bothers me. Like Oral Hershiser right. is older than he is and is more open to advanced ideas, thoughts, analytics, all that kind of stuff, and is open to explaining the game through that lens. It is the w the the old school way in which he views the sport and his resistance to the change. Like I would say that's something to uh, like a feather in McLaughlin's cap is that he can sit down and talk with uh, an old school baseball guy and talk about the old days and, and, and get into that. And then at the same time, turn around the next inning and talk about the, you know, any, any uh, advanced saver metric that you would find on fan graphs or, or talk about win probabilities yeah. or really just the probabilistic nature of baseball and how important that is in, in the modern game. Um, yeah. and, or, uh, and, de and deliver an opinion on it too. Yeah, like he yeah. didn't always agree with it. Didn't always love it, but you know, was able to speak about it in a way that was intelligent and, and, and on point, I guess. Or I know this is an impossible comparison, but, um, you know, Vince Scully, who literally was old school, you know, he'd been yeah. there since, you know, before electricity and, um, you know, he yeah, would the Dodgers are still in Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's crazy stories about him broadcasting from like a wood shed that was off the side of the um, field that was like yeah. 110 degrees in there. But anyway, literally, he'd been there from the beginning, essentially. And, you know, he could talk about 
the history of the game without insulting the current form of the game. And there's, that's where that fine line is as a fan. I want to hear about the history. I want to, I want to hear how um, current players compare to players of previous generations and, and a broadcaster again. Yeah. Regardless of their age, but a broadcaster with that depth of knowledge is really valuable and really helps tie in the game to the broader context, which is part of why I like Bob Costas a lot. Cause I think he does that. Yeah. Um, but if you're going to, try to make the point that the game was somehow better at a different time. It's like anytime someone comes to t- talk to me and say like music was better in the seventies, like that is such a frustratingly boring opinion, you know, right. um, that's how I feel about somebody um, saying that about like a sport was better in a certain decade. Right. Um, but, and like the entire, like, I think the reason most baseball fans like baseball is the nuance is all the yeah. little you can argue about is Goldschmidt as good as McGuire is as good as Keith Hernandez. Like that's the fun part of it. It's a different game. Yeah. It's evolving over time. Yeah. Anyways. Yeah. Anyway. So we're ranting about a problem that hasn't <laughs> yet actually happened, but <laughs> so, so we'll move on because there's more yeah. fun stuff to talk about, but I hope that he's great. Um, I hope that he is fun and we all come to love Chip Carey because he's here now. And so it is what yeah. it is. Yeah. So. I want to end that on a positive note. Maybe there's a chance he goes full granddad, starts cracking Budweiser's and just going full loose cannon saying whatever comes to his mind. And we have a blast for the next however long. Yeah. Like maybe he's been waiting to reach his final form. Like he's, yeah. you know, he's getting to the second half of his career and he's just going to let it rip. Um, but you know, we'll see. Yeah. Um, so we've spent a lot of this off season talking about the Cardinals, uh, starting rotation and its lack of depth. And we've been sort of banging the drum for a multitude of solutions each that as they fall off the board, we just move on to the next one. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, one that we all thought was, a uh, both a realistic possibility and a like legitimate potential solution was the Cardinals trading for Pablo Lopez. Um, Pablo Lopez did get traded. He did. We were right. Nate. We were, we, right. were, we, we nailed it from the beginning. We nailed it. And he yes. went to a team in the central. Yeah. So, I mean, we're basically right. Never take an L bitty boy. We got That's it. Right. Uh, we all knew he was going to go to the twins Ugh. in exchange for Luis Ira, a raise, a rise, a rise, I, can never say it's a hard name to say yeah arias Arias. um al batting champ um you know pretty good player what are your takes what was your take on this trade yeah i mean i think that uh i i think it's a weird trade i think i'm of the opinion that arias is a good hitter who lucked into some power he lacks a position and will likely not repeat. I think he put up four F four this last year or somewhere, maybe a little above that. I think it'd be very unlikely for him to repeat that. I do think that the ballpark in Miami will be good for him, but he's a bad defender. I mean, they were playing the Marlins were playing him as DH first baseman and he's like five, nine, like nope, nobody wants a short first baseman. So like they were kind <laughs> of just forced to play yeah. in there. Um, so you know, that, that being said, he's got a lot of control left. Um, and it's kind of an interesting move. Like I definitely, like I get why the twins made this move. Um, I think that they sold a high on a career season potentially for Arias. Um, I don't, <laughs> I don't really understand the goal, the team, the Marlins are trying to put together. Like I would have tried to get a bopper or somebody with bopper potential and like yeah. if Arias hits five home runs in that ballpark this year, like uh, I, I think that'll be in, like a big, big win for them. Um, so. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. It's yeah. fine. I, I guess like the, I, I guess what like to turn this kind of back to the Cardinals, like the Cardinals don't really have an Arias that they could match this trade with. Like it, it's. Uh, they for sure don't have a one-to-one because Arise is a bit of a unicorn in the sense that he is like a hundredth percentile strikeout, a hundred percentile contact. Like this guy. Yeah. He's, There's just he's not a, a lot in the league, right? Yeah, like he, he's, he's kind yeah. of a freak. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. The best I could think of would be um, 
would have been like a Dylan Carlson, which kind of feels weird, but something that you kind of think has a pretty good floor, which is what I think they're banking on here, um, which is that like, you know, who knows what his power is going to be like, um, but we want someone who can get on base and can do that consistently in a couple different ways. And so with his high batting average, his ability to draw walks, you know, he had a 375 OBP uh, last year. Yeah. And, you know, I think that that must be what they were looking at. There's also a world where maybe he's starting to build some power because last year he hit eight home runs, which is not much, obviously. Um, but it doesn't take a ton of power to th- add on to a 315 to 330 batting average to become like really, really valuable, you yeah. know? So maybe last year was actually just the beginning of, you know, another phase of his career. Cause he is only 25. Yeah. So if suddenly that's not an outlier, but the beginning of an, you know, a growth for him and he can get up to even 10 or 15 home runs, you could see him very easily repeating that for F four yeah. and being a very valuable offensive piece, but it is a gamble because he is not a guy known for his power, obviously. No, um, I, you know, I would so. say if I was Kim Ng and if I was in the Marlins front office, I would I would say I think that we can get this guy to hit 50 doubles and in, uh, in our in Lone Depot Park. I, I think he yeah. can be a doubles machine at the top of the order quality at bat. Like we said, the guy does not strike out. Um, he's on base all the time. It's not really quick. Um but you know he, like I said, he's a unicorn. He's some. He's a weapon that no other team has, and and there's value in that inherently. Um, yeah. But yeah, I he will... almost he almost doubled the amount of doubles he hit from 2021 to 2022. And again, only yeah. being 25, like yeah, it's not going to take a huge step in power for that batting average to become you know no. way more valuable. But but I would say if you were to ask me to bet right now um on who's going to win this trade long term I'd say the, the twins won it fairly easily um I think that you know we talked about Pablo Lopez for quite a bit and I think that he is a, a two or three that could make a change or two as he you know he's 26 he's going to be 27 right. next year he's got if he becomes a ace or at least a number 1 pitcher for the twins in the next couple of years it wouldn't surprise me at all um so yeah yeah I think I think it's just like the I wonder what the Cardinals final offer was um, or if and there maybe, even was one. We or don't if know. There was one. Yeah. Yeah. We don't know what conversations have happened other than that. The Cardinals and, and Marlins had exploratory conversations or some sort of vague yeah. notion like that. Um, yeah. I don't know. I mean, we def like Cardinals could obviously have beaten the trade, um, but it does begin to, you know, what, what comfort level are you, are you at in beating that trade? And also what were the, tw- the Marlins looking for? If they were looking yes. for like established big league player. Um, yeah. You, the Cardinals run out of options really quick. Cause we're basically either trading like one of our starters and then everyone else is like high ceiling prospect exactly. that we hope pans out. And if the Marlins didn't want that, I mean, yeah, there's not much you can and, do. And I think that's what it comes down to is Arias has almost 400 games played in the big leagues. Um, he has shown success at the big leagues. He has had hit over 300 or 294 in all four of his seasons. Like he's a much more known, uh, commodity. And I think that's probably what it came down to. Um, again, who knows what the Cardinals ended up offering. Um, but I will say like, I was very disappointed in this. Yeah. This, this, This broke, broke my little Cardinal heart a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, I think we both agree that the cost wasn't that high, you know, a raise is an interesting, we just talked about all of his value. Um, but that's still not, he's still not in any, like an incredibly high end, um, acquisition for the, for the Marlins. So, you know, it seems like the Cardinals yeah. could have, could have beat it. Um, and, and the twins are just going to have Jose Miranda play first base and they're, who's got big power potential and a lot going on. And he's only 24. And they're not even going to think about this trade. Uh, Yep. I I think as soon as like it's, it just makes sense for them. Um, So yeah, good, good for them. 
it's a good trade for the Marl or for the for the uh, Twins. Pro- almost no matter how a raise develops, it's yeah. a pretty good trade for them. Um, of course, unless he does suddenly start hit, you know hitting twenty home runs with that three twenty, and you know becomes a totally different player. But most are not projecting him to be that way. Uh, Fangraphs has his ceiling game power at a thirty, uh, which on a twenty eighty scale, not great. So. Yeah. And, and, you know, this is going to be a really unfair thing to say, but uh, Tony Gwynn couldn't figure out how to do it. I don't think Arias is going to figure out how to do it. <laughs> um, but, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, um, that's a hard comp to make. So, Well, hitting above 300, I mean, people used to do that in the steroid era. With tw- above 300 with above 20 home runs. It just, it just doesn't happen anymore. But unless you're, uh, you know, Paul Goldschmidt or almost uh, Arenado or yeah, uh, if you're a Hall of Fame level player <laughs> at the peak of your yeah. powers, you can do it. Yes, that is that is a good point. But yeah, like, thank you. We, we shouldn't spend much time on this, but I am so curious to see. Uh, I guess one other thing I'll add to this is the funniest part of it is this guy's a bad, bad uh, defender. Jazz Chisholm is a very, very good defender. And they're going to usurp Jazz Chisholm from his second base uh, position, put him in center field, which he's never played in the outfield, and put yeah. a bad defender at second base. Um, just confusing just, all around. Yeah, why? You know, I'm why make of, two positions know. worse? Just I don't. Yeah. Well, Chisholm could be a good center fielder. You he know, could. Like, He's he never done it. <laughs> like, yeah, but he's one of those guys, you know, like I, I'm a big, he's a freak him. athlete. Yeah. 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 You know, so we'll see how that goes, but yeah, definitely seems strange. It, it all, makes me, th- all, yeah. makes me think of that scene from Moneyball where it was like, Oh, you, you can learn first base. It's not that hard. And then they look at Ron Washington. It's actually incredibly hard. Um, <laughs> so yeah. yeah, yeah, we'll see. All right. Well, we've got um, a couple other things we want to talk about, including the Zips projections that have come out for the uh, 2023 Cardinals, which is always an exciting topic. But before we get to that, we want to remind everybody that this show is supported on Patreon. We are getting ready to start the 2023 season. How exciting is that? Very exciting. You've already chosen to listen to this podcast, which we appreciate. Consider taking the next step and joining our Patreon, getting in the Discord. We're having constant conversations in there. We'd love to have you in the Discord with us. Subscribers at any level get access to that. We're talking about doing some live streams this year. Uh, we'll figure out what that looks like, but watching games together, uh, you know, in the in the voice chat or just in chat, however you're comfortable. Um, So we've got a bunch of cool stuff we're planning for 2023. We'd love to have you be a part of it. Patreon.com slash talking about birds. And then also consider leaving us a review on your favorite podcast platform. It helps. Uh, Ben, where else can people find us online? Yeah. Make sure to follow us on Twitter at talk about birds where we're uh, tweeting about our uh, chip carry uh, opinions and not much else right now, but a lot of, a lot of chip carry takes on there. Uh, you can follow us on Instagram at talking about birds. And of course you can email us directly at talk about birds at gmail.com. If you have any questions, thoughts, concerns, uh, alternative broadcasts that you'd like us to watch, whatever it might be, um, and yeah, I'll just hit that again. Uh, hit us up on Patreon. The first tier is at two dollars, um, and you know we we would appreciate it. Um, outside of that, tell your friends, um, your your cardinal freak friends that are probably out there. Maybe I should learn Spanish, and we can and watch the uh, the Benji Molina broadcast. That'd be a good way to learn Spanish. We it would be yeah, a would. very focused version of Spanish, but. Uh, <laughs> Um, I can I think communicate specifically about on-field events. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, so um, Zips. Uh, Zips is a projection system created by uh, Dan Zim- Zimborski. Nailed it. Um, who is a writer for fan graphs and all around uh, cool dude. Um, and no, he's not. He's like the biggest <laughs> nerd on the internet, and I love him I- for it. That's what I was going to say. I think he's a, I think he's a super cool dude. Uh, he's also into, um, a, a lot of video games. So, uh, D and D nerd, AI yeah. nerd, tech nerd in general. Yeah. He's great. Yeah. So he invented a projection system that has essentially been integrated into fan graphs. It's zips Z I P S. 
Um, and you know, every projection system has its own, um, you know, ups and downs and there's, a, everybody has their own opinion on their favorite projection system. Um, but zips is one of the most popular, most well-received and most, um, like available. You see it everywhere, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I probably is just the most popular projection system. Maybe steamer is, is, uh, or, um, um, oh my God, uh, Pacoda. Pacoda is yeah. another is another one that's pretty popular. But um, the bat, yeah. Uh, one of the things I like about Zips though is the uh, is the article that they put out every year with the projection systems, and it just kind of gives you a breakdown of you know what the system expects the the team to do, and uh, it's always a lot of fun when when your team's Zips projections come out. So that happened basically as we were recording last week's episode. So we didn't get a chance to talk about it. So we wanted to talk about it uh, today. So um, check it out. Like, I don't think we're going to go through the whole thing, but if you haven't looked at it yet, um, look on fan graphs, or if you just like Google Cardinals zips, Z I P S you would find it. Yeah. I believe um, I have also the, the, it is on our Twitter, the, uh, nice, the graphic yeah. at least. So what stood out to you this year about it, Ben, anything yeah. stand out to you? Two, two big standouts for me. Um, I would say the number one standout to me was the production of the relief crew, um, mm-hmm. which last year was really not great. Um, and this year is projecting to be one of the best bullpens in baseball. Um, now, obviously, when Helsley puts up a season like he did last year, that that makes everything look better. Um, but you know, it, it, as far as the projections, we, uh, he is showing Helsley, Gallegos, Palante, Hicks, Stratton, Cabrera, Woodford, Hudson, Verhagen, and Rodriguez as the relief crew, all putting up five war, which I believe puts them in the top five, uh, in baseball. Uh, I think there's only one team that hasn't, or no, no, many teams still haven't put up their zips projections yet. Um, but that crew being a, a big strength, I think that we, that it's kind of just confirming something that I felt. And I think that we all kind of know, I do. I'm curious to see what Stratton's uh, like, they were really, really excited about a lot of Stratton's, uh, you know, baseball Savantes, that Cassie type spin rates and stuff like that. So I'm curious to see what kind of role he takes in a full season. I think he did a pretty good job. Um, and Palante, I would say is a huge question mark. I think he's going to compete for a starting rotation spot, but the bullpen makes so much sense for him. Um, especially if you can get a strike ups out a little bit with that curveball, um, so that has me really, really excited. Just the whole relief core being projected, how they're being projected. And I think the other big standout is uh, the catcher position. I think we'll, we talked about this earlier this year, but the catcher position was essentially a black hole for the Cardinals last year, and Zips is putting it at a three win, uh, which is obviously above average, and that's that's Contreras really turning that entire position around 180 degrees. Um, so yeah, I, yeah. I'm, I'm really happy about those things. Uh, I think those kind of what stuck out to me. And I guess since I'm blabbering on um, the O'Neill projection is, I think probably better than one might expect. Um, it has him as being a slightly above average player. He's somebody who has really had some, you know, issues last year. And sometimes that'll, you know, zips is, like all projection systems, they can be pessimistic um, because, you know, that's how baseball go. Um, but I think seeing him as an above average player uh, putting up 2.7 war. And I think that, you know, it is not crazy to see him to or, or to imagine him doubling that. Um, but having that as his, you know, floor or whatever you want to call it, I think is, is something to be excited about. Yeah, I agree. And and so, um, you know, some helpful numbers here, the league average war um is two so you know we often think of like z when you when you think of war you might think zero is league average and then it goes up or down from there um but zero is replacement level and so most teams are you know most big leaguers are trying to hit at least two in a single year to be average or better right um and so what stood out to me too um was that the entire cardinal position the incar- the entire cardinal team projects to be over two there is no position that the cardinals are below average which is kind of the cardinal way of course you know um but still like 
it can't be overstated like how valuable that actually is. That's why the Cardinals are constantly putting up winning seasons. They might not have the best season, but um, odds are they're going to win more games than they lose because every single position has someone that's at least league average, if not above league average. Even the best teams usually have like one or two spots where it's like, ah, eh, don't look over there. The rest of the team will make up for it. But the Cardinals yep. have average or, or better than average everywhere. Um, I thought it was interesting to see how Zips projects um, some regression that we're all expecting. Uh, Goldie at 35 just had essentially a career year. And so I think it's fair to assume that next year he will not be as good. Um, but Zip still projects him at uh, 4.5 F4, which I think is a, a really good projection, a really good, like really safe. And I think we should all be really, really happy if Goldschmidt puts up four and a half next year. Hell yeah. That is still, um, you know, all star level output, um, not MVP anymore, but yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, so. I think that's, that's, you know, what the craziest thing is that you have, on this projection system, if it just goes the way that Zips is saying, Arenado, Goldie, and Edmund being all stars next year or in the all star conversation. Yeah. I mean, it, this could, again, now with the um, addition of Contreras, which everyone, ourselves included, have been pretty disappointed with this offseason, but the Contreras addition is huge. It is a full 180 on a position that has been really rough for the Cardinals, at least offensively. Um, so when you look at, uh, we've got three for Contreras, 5.8 for Arenado, 4.4 for Edmund, two and a half ish for Donovan slash Gorman at second. And then Goldschmidt at four and a half, like could be the best infield in the NL. Yeah. Right. And I think for, so those three players and Contreras, I think, uh, like everyone, but second base on the infield, we, I, I think I feel pretty good about those projections. And I think I could easily tell a story, which O'Neill breaks 2.7. I could tell a story where Carlson and Newt bar and center break 2.8 and, a, a story where uh Newt bar and Jordan Walker break, break the 2.2. Like there is, it, it is. You don't have to go that far to imagine them beating those projections. Now, obviously, injuries, all, you know, it can it can derail everything. But there is a story for all of those players to be above average, which is extremely exciting. Yeah. Um, again, like this Cardinal team should score runs. It should be yeah. uh, it should be a very good offense and yeah. coupled with a really good defense like and then we're going to and yeah so you can see where we're going here <laughs> like this is largely the same team the same approach in 2023 as to what we saw in 2022 right we're going in with a pretty set lineup that has we like to think a very high floor and a potential for a ceiling that is huge and we got that in 2022 with Goldschmidt and Arenado they hit like 90th percentile projections right and that's part of why the cardinals won 93 games and so on and so forth and it made up for the same problem that we went into last year with that we're seeing this year which is the starting rotation which yeah. as it's listed here you say okay you know it's not great but it's not bad uh they've got michaelis at 2.9 montgomery at 3.4 leading the staff Wainwright at two, Flaherty at 2.5, which is kind of nice. And then Matt's, Libertor, and Hudson all below average. Um, but all still above replacement level, you yeah. know, um, which it's like, okay. I mean, we're just going to be repeating uh, everything we've already been saying here. Honestly, right? honestly, I think the projections are rosier than I would expect it. Yeah. Um, I, I will say that, like, Michaelis is a, a prime regression candidate. Uh, Wayne Wright's a prime regression candidate. We have no idea what to expect from Flaherty. Um, and, and we have a decent idea. Like, I, I think it's fair to be optimistic about Montgomery and then no idea what to expect about Matt Slippertor. And I mean, Hudson might be the current biggest question mark on the roster. Um, yeah. I like, I have absolutely zero expectations um, around him, but it's slightly rosier than one would expect. It is a competitive starting five six ish, seven, whatever the Cardinals are going to be rolling out. Um, 
but it, it's going to be relying yeah. up on that position player group. Yeah. I mean, it's the same thing we've been talking about this whole time that if those five, six guys are healthy all year and perform around what you expect them to, they don't even need to break out. They just need to kind of do what you're expecting. Yeah. The Cardinals have a pretty good rotation. Combine it with an elite offense and maybe an elite uh, relief core. And you got another 90 plus wins and an easy cruise into the playoffs, which at that point it's a crapshoot, right? Um, but that whole thing falls apart the moment one of those <laughs> one or two of those uh, guys in the first four on that list start to yeah. fall off. Yeah. Right? Assuming health, the central's locked up, but uh, you know, that's yeah. why they play the games. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it kind of just reinforced like everyone's opinions already. Um, but again, I do think like, and, and um, Simborski talked about it in his article that he's like, I think Zips likes the Cardinals better than anyone else likes the Cardinals, you know, <laughs> yeah. because you do, you project all these guys individually and you come up with this and that's cool. But like each of these guys have their own path to it going horribly in a way that like not as many teams have as the Cardinals, yeah. if that makes sense. So there's like way more, I think, range of outcomes with the Cardinals than you have with a team like the Braves or um, the Mets. You know? Sure. So, yeah. But uh, it's fun. I mean, I love a good projection system. Oh, yeah. and, and, and what I like about Zips, too, is that it it doesn't try to actually build you a balanced projection to say, like, this is what's going to actually happen in 2023. Like it hands out 350 at bats to like every prospect, you know? Um, so it's, it's not really trying to actively create what's going to happen. It's like in a vacuum, we think this player will get roughly, you know, this amount of at bats and here's what they could do with them. And it goes even into projecting like 90th percentile outcomes and what those could look like. Um, I was really excited to look at, you know, our, Dylan Carlson, 90 percentile or 80 percentile outcomes. Like what does a, a breakout look like for some of these guys? And it it's a lot of fun. So yeah. if you're into that stuff, um, you know, we obviously are highly recommend you check out the article. We'll probably be referencing and we already have, but we'll be referencing zips like just through the whole season. Hundo P uh, really quick before we move on from this. Uh, I just, so he also will do uh top uh, near age offensive comps for the players and Lars new bars. Number one offensive comp uh, for his age bracket is Cody Bellinger. So who <laughs> needs Cody when you got one at home? He's obviously not the defender, but uh, Hey, we'll see what happens. Which Cody Bellinger is that uh, a comp to is whenever, it whenever they're the same age. So I don't know how I, I'd have to do a little bit of digging to, to figure that all out. How old is new right now? Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll figure that out while we keep talking. Yeah. Okay. Um, cool. Well, the next thing, uh, we wanted to talk about, we want to dig in a little bit more into some of the stuff that's come out after, uh, winter warm up and all the different interviews and, um, Ben, I know you've been talking about this, um, and I, I've been kind of starting to feel it a little bit as well. Um, really enjoying hearing what some of these players are starting to say about the new pitching coach, Dusty Blake. Um, really, really compelling, really interesting. Um, why don't you dig in a yeah. little bit about it? Yeah, it's like uh, everyone is doing that thing. Um, how to like. Dusty Blake is great. We loved Maddox. Mad Dog is the man. But man, Dusty Blake is really cool, though. They're all kind yeah. of like walking the line there, which I think is funny. I think it's also just, you know, in respect and, and reference to to Mad yeah. Dog. Um, but so what I thought was really interesting um, was that Dusty Blake was at the winter warm up. And I think this was just a big thing that we missed in our conversation last week that I want to run back to is the talking about building a pitching lab, like an actual pitching lab, like a driveline type mm -hmm. facility for the Cardinals organization. Um, you know, a, a lot of teams already have this, but Dusty Blake is kind of leading the charge and getting this created and actually like, you know, but literally putting hammer to nail. Um, so it's, it's talking about maximizing the use uh, the organization's use of modern methods and technology. And part of that is the pitch design. So basically looking at Dakota Hudson and saying, okay, why is your sinker, uh, cement mixing, why isn't it diving down? 
and being able to sit in with him, make adjustments, show him in real time, and kind of design that together. Um, and I want to read a quote from Dakota Hudson, kind of talking about working with Dusty Blake. Um, and Dakota says, um, he's a lot more in tune with everything and a very bright mind as far as baseball goes in general and the analytical stuff he brought in. Okay. <laughs> baseball player talking. It was <laughs> yeah, something what? that changed. <laughs> uh, this part I think is, is interesting though. It was something that changed my view of the game itself. So like, again, this is Dakota Hudson talking about it, but really what he's like, I think what's shining through is that Dusty Baker or Dusty Baker, um, love Dusty Baker. Shout out. Uh, Dusty Blake is able to take these really high concept, complicated, nuanced changes and, and how it can benefit the player and basically break it down. It, it's taking the super high tech, advanced analytical approach and delivering it in that quote unquote old school baseball. Here you go, boy, let it rip um, terminology that seems to be it, it, it. Dakota Hudson is speaking highly of them. Jack Flaherty is speaking highly of them. Uh, Drew Verhagen is speaking highly of him. Like he's working with these guys who are kind of on the periphery, and I'm sure he's working with everybody, but being able to get every little ounce of, of talent out of these guys and making sure that their pitches are working together. I think that's something that like the Cardinals, you, you don't really hear the Cardinals talking about really until Ali Marmel started bringing it up last year, the idea of pitch tunneling of how pitches work with other pitches. If you throw your fast, your four seam fastball through a certain arm tunnel, you want to throw a curveball through that same arm tunnel arm tunnel. So the hitter thinks it's the same pitch. And then of course the curveball dips down rather than right, you know, quote unquote rising as the four seamer does. So I'm kind of blabbering on, um, but I think it's really exciting to have somebody yeah. like that in the organization. He seems to be taking the kind of Jeff Albert soup to nuts. This is how the organization is looking at this, this, this area of performance and completely revamping it. Um, so I'm really, really, really excited about that. And I'm hoping you know, I don't know, Katie, we can trap them and, and make them talk more about this kind of thing. But I, I find it really, really fascinating. Do you think that he gives as good uh, shoulder rubs to his pitchers as it, when he goes out to uh, talk to them as Mike Maddox did? <laughs> I do not. <laughs> I do. You know, you're, you're uh, you don't want to. I don't know how to. It, it's his thing. You know, you can't you can't yeah. chop his thought. You got to You got to leave that alone. The claw is the claw. Um, yeah. And he's taking his talents to Texas. Uh, <laughs> so, no, but I do like it. It seems like Ali Marmol's thought process, not that it was being pushed back against, but is being, uh, I don't Maybe. know, like what? It's now embraced a little bit. Yeah. Because ex- Mike Maddox exactly. was definitely, you know, old school. Like that was part of his appeal, right? Yes. Is this like, gritty guy he's been around for a long lot long time following in the footsteps of dave duncan and yeah. and the sort of pitching coach that the cardinals have always had you know that they're gonna get they can stand toe-to-toe with chris carpenter you know um and uh, yeah i think and just hearing you don't near you don't hear a lot of major leagues athletes say like this one guy changed my perspective on the game on the once they've game, already reached yeah. on baseball. He Dakota Hudson is saying he's looking at the game differently than he did before. And yeah. like not to take away from uh, Maddox, but, you know, Maddox has a proven track record. He, you know, immediately improved Montgomery coming over. But, you know, he was like, why don't you throw that fastball hard and inside? And Dusty Blake is like, OK, why don't we manipulate the rotation on this baseball so it plays off your change up better? Um, right. And I think, you know, we're we're definitely pro information and and like I want to get in the yeah. weeds with all this stuff. Yeah, it's it's way more modern. People have been saying like, hey, throw it high and tight, you know, yeah. from the beginning of there being pitching. Right. Yeah. So H- have you considered yeah. letting it rip? Sir, Ooh, the high stinky cheese, <laughs> <laughs> the Lindberger, Ooh, um, Rowan Gardner. There you right. go. Uh, yeah, so we'll see. Um, but I think we've said it a lot on this show. Like the Cardinals have not been great at developing starting pitching for quite a while now and not at the major league level. So maybe this is it. Maybe this is the start of something that can can change that. 
Yeah, go um, uh, go go sign Alex Reyes. <laughs> He's still out there. Bring him back. Um, bring him back. They might. Probably not though. They should. It's interesting that no one has signed him yet. I know. Save for Waka. Waka's out there. Waka Waka. <laughs> Some Cardinals, ex-Cardinals pitchers yeah. just sitting out there. Yeah. Anyways. All right. Speaking of uh, movement around the league, let's run through some of the some of the action that's happened uh, across the league over the last week. Yeah. Let's uh, the Red Sox. Uh, really, the it's it's kind of Royals. The Royals are just kind of ripping up the carpet right now. Um, you know, the new owner, new GM. Uh, they're they're. I think they are about to become the Midwest Rays, um, if everything goes to plan, I think that they're, they have a really smart group over there and they're, they're ripping down the studs right now. So, uh, to that point, the Red Sox are acquiring, acquiring infielder Alberto Mondesi, uh, for a player to be named later for, uh, from the Royals. Um, and, so the Red Sox is, and Josh Taylor, right. An injured left-handed reliever. I think uh, was a part of the deal. Yeah. Well, when I wrote this down, it was a uh, player to be okay. named later. Um, but yeah, that, that sounds right. Uh, cause you said it, but this That's right. answers, you know, we we're kind of talking about like, what the hell are the Red Sox going to do with the shortstop position? Well, Alberto Mondesi is a shortstop, um, and he's really fast and that's, that's Alberto Mondesi. Um, again, the Red yeah, Sox I really hope are fine. Alberto Mondesi, besides being a really fun name to say, um, is one of the, is a really, really compelling player. That these guys pop up every few years and it never seems to click. But he's one of those guys that everyone's like, if he can just get on base consistently, he's gonna steal a hundred bases. Yeah, right. He's so fast, um, but he just doesn't do everything else that's needed to support that, including stay healthy, which is the biggest problem he's had. But he is only twenty-seven years old, so uh, this could be a huge buy low for the Red Sox. Or it could be the continuation of, you know, Adalberto's career where he struggles to stay healthy and ultimately doesn't really provide much. But, um, you know, 2020 and 2019, well, he stole almost 100 bases um, between 2018 and 2020. So, like, there's a version of him that's playing pretty good defense and stealing 60 bases, and it's a ton of fun. But um, I think really the Red Sox should have traded for Paul DeYoung. Um, yeah. And I mean, again, it's, Chris Hale for Paul DeYoung felt fair, but maybe that's just me. Yeah. I, I think he's a fine defender and he, he's obviously got the speed, but his, he just can't hit like, yeah, everything about his batter bro at batter ball profile is just trash. Um, I don't know. I mean, I feel like a 37% strikeout rate last year is, is pretty good. <laughs> He was injured was essentially 50, all year. Yeah, it was only year. fifty, only fifty uh, plate appearances. Um, but um, but yeah. boy, howdy, is he fast? Abysmal walk rate. That's what uh, I'm saying. Like he just, yeah. Well, it's like Billy Hamilton, right? It's like these guys who you know, like speed is their primary thing, and they just if they could do like one other thing to right. get on base, they'd be, you know the most successful person in the league, but sure. they just, all they are is fast. All they are is fast. Uh, in other Royals news, the twins acquire Michael a Taylor, uh, for a couple of minor league relievers whose names I didn't care enough to write down. Um, but the twins now have a Byron Buxton backup plan. That's some good. Alliteration Byron Buxton there. backup boy. Byron Buxton uh, backup boy. Yeah, I mean, Taylor's another one of those players that's fun. Like, at times, it looked like he was going to have a 2020 season, and then other times, it looks like he's not going to be in the league for very long. Um, but improvement uh, for him to go to the Twins. Yeah. We'll see where see how it goes. Yeah, he might be the best or one of the best center fielders in the league, and and that's, that's nothing to you know, sneeze at. Um, other Royals news. Um, this is a disappointing Royals move, but I think a shrewd one. Uh, they sign or all this Chapman to a one year, $3.75 million deal. Uh, to me, this reeks of hopefully he still has some of all Chapman in him. Uh, we'll trade him for prod spe- prospects midway through the season. Um, yep. and keep doing the rebuild thing. Um, or all Chapman kind of a crummy human being. So it's too bad that he has a job. Uh, but again, probably a, sh- I, I think expect this kind of play from the Royals. Like I said, I think that they are, 
are going to be very shrewd and very calculated for the next handful of years. And as they kind of rise back to uh, uh, being competitive, but that, that happened. Yeah. Um, I guess I just agree with everything you said. Sure. It makes sense. Wish it didn't happen, but it makes sense. Somehow in even worse baseball news, Artie Moreno is no longer pursuing the sale <laughs> of the angels, uh, which is massively disappointing to people named Otani trout, uh, and a lot of people in Southern California. Um, there was just recently a story about how, uh, Moreno <laughs> essentially forced their Spanish language broadcaster to broadcast, do his full broadcast on his own. They cut his pay, made him a co- independent contractor and, and basically like everything Moreno does is bad for baseball and bad for the angels. Um, but basically he said that he got cold feet. Uh, when the sale was coming to fruition, it had nothing to do. People were offering big, big money. Um, he just, he just couldn't let it go. Um, yeah, what a, I, honestly, I think I, this is like, this is it's just wild. bad for the game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's bad because, you know, we don't really like them as owners. And then it also like, I don't know. You just like, what a, what a time, I guess it's pretty emblematic of like them as decision makers of owners of this team, you know, like how do you decide to sell, get all the way to the point where you're in the negotiations and offer stage and then decide like, eh, never mind. Like yeah. there's so much work and effort and time that goes into trying to acquire a baseball team and, and just putting it up for sale. Like, I don't know that it's a like multi billion ins- dollar deal. Yeah, it's an insane thing to just like, I woke up one day and decided I couldn't bear to not own this baseball team anymore. It's like you had to have had that feeling this yeah. whole time, you know, and, who you know, who knows where the initial decision came from, what pressures he was feeling from other yeah. directions, you know, who knows. But um, yeah, it would have been way cooler if uh, he was not owning a baseball team anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, like, I don't like a lot of the owners. A lot of them are, are whatever. I think he is one of the few owners that I could say this. He is the reason the angels are not good. Yeah. Like he's the reason they've been irrelevant for since 2002, uh, I think was when they won with like David Eckstein and Adam Kennedy. Right. And, uh, some Garrett <laughs> those, Atkins those, maybe it was Garrett those Adam. mashers. Whoever. Yeah. They had a yeah. team back then, but they won. Um, all right, moving on. Ump's retiring. This is something we haven't really talked about yet, but we're having the largest ump retirement party in like 20 or 30 years. Um, get them out of there. Get them out of there. Uh, so I'm just going to really quickly go through, uh, this is going to bring a huge, um, a huge rookie class, which, uh, if this is not something you really pay attention to, that's fine. But it is, it is almost a rule that younger umps do better behind the plate than older, umps um i think for obvious reasons right like being an umpire especially behind the plate is really hard to do um especially with the increased velocity and you know like trying right. in, insane sliders and all the stuff that is happening now but uh, i'm just gonna go quickly through the names uh ted barrett marty foster greg gibson tom hallion sam holbrook jerry meals paul newart jim reynolds tim timmons and bill welke all retiring from baseball all of those guys have at least 22 years in the big leagues. Um, and I think that, so that's, uh, it was 10 of those guys. Did I miss anyone? Um, doesn't matter. Uh, and that's going to open up jobs. I think they said they're going to bring up 12, uh, young, um, so there's going to be a little bit more rotation and everything like that. But, uh, some new names that we'll get to learn to hate this year. Um, I am, uh, I'm very happy about this move. I will say I'm very happy about some of the changes that baseball is doing, even though we like to criticize Manfred a lot. The testing of the automatic strike zone um, and the challenge system are something that I think we'll probably be talking about all season. I am very hopeful that these umpires do a good job and the challenge system is going to be the thing that wins out. Um, But we shall see. Yeah. We haven't talked about that yet. It was announced, but like a week and a half ago or so, yeah. um, that AAA is going to have a like an A B test, yeah, for um, robot umps behind the plate, and it does make me wonder if some of these guys who are retiring, obviously they've just been in the league for a while, and some of them are old, but like, is this big abundance of it? Uh, just a bunch of these dudes being like, 
we're just getting out before this huge sea change of robot umps starts yeah. to happen. And we're just, we'll just back out now because we don't want to have to like learn a whole new thing. <laughs> we've been doing it for 20 plus years and right. You know, so I, I have to imagine that it's been impactful on at least a few people's decisions. I, I can't imagine it's a non-factor. That's for sure. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, I think maybe we save that for a, a later discussion around like really the differences between the the new um, robot systems that are coming. Yeah. Um, but overall, I am very excited about them. I, you and I have kind of different opinions on this. I want a fully mechanized umpiring. Yeah, you you want to kill the catching position, and I would like to save it. Yeah, that's 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 what I want. I want there to be, but. I, but I also want there to be um, like a double home run bucket out in the outfield, too, that yeah. if you hit it right into that bucket, it's worth two. So, you know, we've got different opinions, different things that, you know, we want to see the game adopt. So, yeah, let's well, not uh, multi ball. I'm into. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll discuss. But, I but yeah, we should I mean, just it, adopt full burns ball rules. I, I think, you know, why? Why half change? Just go full step. And, right. Yeah. It looks fun. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll cover some of that a little bit later but um yeah i mean it's interesting to see so many different umpires all retire at the same time um and i can't wait to just ooh, get mad at these new guys <laughs> ooh, ooh. <laughs> I'm, I'm, <laughs> man my tweets are gonna be fire oh, this year you guys come on blue there you go there's a sale down at Lens Crafters. Yeah, light him up, yeah. Nate. <laughs> yeah. He said it. Yeah, wear him out, bro. All right. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> so that's everything we've got um, for the the news portion of this show. Yeah, I, think I should be an umpire now I that think I... So. Yeah. Yeah, you, you have the best eyesight of anyone I know, and I think that, <laughs> that is what umpires require. So you're, you're set for yeah. success. They'd be like... I'd be like uh what now <laughs> oh he threw he pitched i didn't see it you would hear it i think it's 103 yeah maybe yeah um 103 i literally don't think <laughs> i would see it in real I life i don't think you would either yeah so all right uh so we're gonna end as we always do um got a little little game here for you ben so uh this episode We've talked about it a little bit. Um, we've got the Oscar nominations out right now. Uh, Hollywood's a, a, you know, the tip of everyone's tongue. We talk a lot of <laughs> we talk so a lot stupid. about movies. <laughs> God. We talk a lot about movies on this show. <laughs> um, and I found a list. I know you love lists. Uh, on MLB.com. Wow. Is the top 25 baseball movies of all time. Okay. Written by Will Leach, who is a respected writer. Sure. So, um, want to see how many of the top 10 you can name the best baseball movies of all time, according to MLB.com, and a very special movie edition of Who Charted? Who Charted? Who Charted? All right. So, um, top 10 films. I got a list in front of me. Three outs and the game's over. Uh, what do you got? Uh, this, I'm trying to think of which one is going to be number one. I think, I mean, there's one right answer. We'll see if Will Leach agrees. Bull Durham, number one with a bullet. Let's go. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Was that the top? Um, that is the top, number yeah. one. You haven't seen it. Get that. Yeah. I haven't seen it yet. I know. I I have a a poor baseball movie history. I've not yeah. seen the majority of this list. Yeah, um, uh, you suck shit, Nate. <laughs> Jesus Christ! <laughs> <laughs> no, you uh, do. Oh, uh, got me. Um, I next, do not suck shit. <laughs> <laughs> next one, Field of Dreams. Field of Dreams. Yeah. Number. Four oh, okay. List. All right. Uh, I'm going to go with 61. Is that number two? Yeah. What? Let me see if he has it on the overall list. 
61, number 23. Oh, my on his God. List. Swing and a miss, Will Leach. I aggressively disagree with you. It's a Billy Crystal classic. It's a Billy Crystal classic. It's a Billy Crystal classic. Um. Barry Pepper uh, playing Roger Merritt. How do you? What are you doing? Yep. Um, Terrible take by Will Leach. Here, well, here you'll love this. Billy Crystal's ode to the home run chase between Mickey Mantle and Roger Ma- Maris is basically baby boomer catnip. <laughs> that was his. That's wow. his little blur. What a nuanced take. Thanks, Will. <laughs> Dumbass. Um, uh, you got one out. Okay. Uh, Forty-two. We'll go with another numbered movie. Story of Jackie Robinson. You're out. This okay. I am now calling this list <laughs> horseshit. <laughs> Hold on. I don't even care 42. if I lose now. Number nineteen. The story of Jackie Robinson's and Brand Tricky's battles to integrate baseball benefit greatly from its stars, Harrison Ford and the late Chadwick Boseman. Yeah, it's got Chadwick in it. Mm-hmm. Playing Jackie Robinson. <laughs> What are hey, we you doing here? Get, you don't have to convince me. Okay, I let's, love Chadwick. Uh, okay, let's see. What is he? You got one here? more out. Yeah, and I'm honestly, I, I kind of want to just get it over with because this this list is <laughs> like true garbage. Um, wow. Pride of the Yankees. All right, there you go, Benny wow. boy. Wow. Gorilla gets back on the board. Yeah. Number three, Pride of the Yankees. Yeah. Um, the natural. Okay, now now we got a hit streak going. Now here. I'm okay. Now I'm getting what he's natural lagging. is number seven. Yeah. Okay. Um. Let's do ooh, the Sandlot. Nice. One of my favorite movies of all time. Yeah. Watched it recently. Number eight, The Sandlot. So you've had a little run here. You've got number one. Number three, number four, number seven, and number eight. If this next one that I'm about to guess isn't on it, I am I'm happy to lose. Eight men okay. out. Story of the Black Sox. One of my favorite that, baseball movies. Yep. Okay. There that's you good. go. That is that is number five. Number five. Do I, I so, haven't got number two yet? Is that true? Um that is true. You've not gotten number two. You have still to go number two, number six. Nine and ten. Okay, I think. At, yeah, go on. I'm gonna go. I think that he probably put this movie as number two, in a league of their own. Yes, you got it with a button. Number All two. Right. Um. Okay. Now my my brain cachet is starting to, <laughs> to deplete a little bit. Um, I can't imagine this is top 10, especially with his pretentious ass list, but I'm going to say major league. That is number 10. Hey, okay. Um, yeah, I was going to say this is a spoiler to some degree, but I have seen two of the remaining three, um, which is saying a lot cause I've not seen most of these. Um, and you just got one of them. I have seen okay. major league. I think based on your slight spoiler, um, and the fact that this is a great movie, I'm going to say Moneyball. You got it. Yep. He has Moneyball as number six. Okay. Um, great movie. I really, great movie. That. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You got no. one left. Yeah. Struggling now there. I mean, there's so many, I'm trying to think of the name of that Lou Gehrig movie. Um, or maybe that's Pride of the Yankees. Maybe I'm getting things confused. Um, I'm going to say Angels in the Outfield. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, let me see. Is Angels in the Outfield on the list? I, I can't. Um, I mean, it's a kid movie. It, it is. And lots it's of kid number, movie, too. It's number 22. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I haven't seen that one since childhood, but I, I, I like, I really enjoyed that movie too. I there are so many the, baseball movies. Yeah, I wonder if Rookie of the Year is on here. Rookie, yep, of, the year rookie, is. Of, the, rookie of the Year number twenty. Oh, I was gonna say that is like clearly worse than Angels in the Outfield. Oh, you think so? I always thought of Rookie of the Year is better. But, the whole mechanic um, doesn't even make sense. 
but the an- uh, literal Christopher Lloyd as an angel. <laughs> I mean, at least we're being like otherworldly. Like everything else in that movie takes place in the real world, except for this kid's arm heals in a way that makes no sense. Nah, I didn't know you were a doctor. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, so you know what? Rookie of the year, you do get John Candy in the booth. So yeah, no, I, I, I retract my statement. I forgot about John. Gary Candy. Busey. Yeah. Um, you get, uh, Gary Busey should not have been allowed to act with a child. It was a different Gary Busey. It was, <laughs> it was the before Gary Busey. <laughs> okay. Um, and you get, um, shoot, what's his name? Um, Marv from home alone. Yeah. Being a total the equipment you know, manager, yeah, yeah, he gets caught in between the two doors yeah. in the hotel room, <laughs> which was like a big fear of my childhood <laughs> from that movie alone. <laughs> so, all right, uh, the the one you missed, I had never heard of. Yeah, so I is the only one I'd never even heard of. It's called Everybody Wants Some. Oh, damn it! Yeah, yeah, that's that. Okay. Uh, it's like the unofficial sequel to Dazed and Confused. Um, that's a, it's a very good baseball movie. It's a very good movie, um, but not something that I th- like doesn't occupy a lot of space in my brain. But that is a good movie. If you have not seen it, highly recommend it. It's it's like Dazed and Confused meets baseball. And I think if that doesn't sell you, then like don't watch it. But it's it's a good movie. Yeah. Um, yeah. Look, cool. I, I like Richard Linkletter. Um, so. Uh, yeah, so the full list, I'm going to run down the whole list here for you. Uh, Bull Durham, A League of Their Own, The Pride of the Yankees, Field of Dreams, Eight Men Out, Moneyball, The Natural, The Sandlot, Everybody Wants Some, Major League, The Bad News Bears. So now we're getting out into the out of the top 10. Uh, Bang the Drum Slowly, The Bingo Long Traveling All Stars and Motor Kings. Have you ever heard of that? Nope. Nope. All right. The Rookie, Take oh, Me Out to the Ball one, Game, yeah. Damn Yankees, Sugar, Fear Strikes Out, 42, Rookie of the Year, Mr. 3000. Uh, some people call me Mr. 3000. Angels <laughs> in the Outfield, 61, Cobb, and For the Love of the Game. So yeah. that was okay. Will Each's list. Well, so. it makes me, I think I need to rewatch 61 to, to reestablish my feelings on that. And I will just say, if you were listening to this and you have not watched eight men out, it is one of my favorite all time baseball movies. Um, and it is specifically around the black Sox scandal. It's a, it's a fun narrative. It is very good. Um, go check it out. Um, and I know Nate, yep. you still have not seen bull Durham. Go watch bull Durham. What are you doing? I know we should do it for the show or something like, um, I don't know if that would be interesting. To it's got to be content with you, doesn't it? If you're not doing it for content, <laughs> what are you doing it for? <laughs> sure. Yeah. All right. Maybe the Alamo well, will uh, will do a uh, uh, like a when a, you know when they bring an old movie out. Maybe they'll do a showing of that around the uh, the baseball season beginning. Yeah. They're doing all the Lord of the Rings extended oh, cuts right now. That's awesome. And I know. I'm like, I don't. It's not going to work for us right now, but like, ooh, that sounds yeah. fun. We just started rewatching the uh, Beatles Get Back documentary. I can, I can, I want all the Peter Jackson in my life all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I love the I, Lord of the Rings. I saw all of them in the theater like three times. Yeah. And, yeah. But I've not seen them really since then. I've been kind of craving oh, watching man. them again. Yeah. I watch yeah. those like every few years there. Yeah. Yeah. They hold up. They're great. Oh, man, I was about to do a Samwise uh, impression, and I just backed out last second. All Mm -hmm. right, everybody, thank you for listening to the show. We'll be back next week. Uh, Pitchers and Catchers report in just a few weeks. (laughs) We're almost there. Um, So thank you all for listening. Patreon.com slash Talking About Birds. Get in there. Support the show. Join the bird scored. We're having a great time. We'll be back next Thursday. Until then. I don't know. Was they like do something? Kind of, yeah. Just like one more thing. That's all we're asking for. Po, tape, toes. <laughs> I want to hear the one about about Frodo. <laughs> um, right, no. Hang up. Bye. <laughs>
Kingdom.